Salisbury Plain in southern England, 2500 BC, the same time as the pyramids in Egypt are under construction. Workers here complete the outer circle of Stonehenge. They haul huge rocks, some weighing up to 45 tons, across rough terrain. They work each granite-like stone into shape, then pull them upright to form the great stone circle. Thousands of people work on this massive project. But while we know this was an incredible feat of engineering, who these people were and why they built Stonehenge has remained one of the great unsolved mysteries of the ancient world. Hang on a minute. This is a lot of old nonsense. What I really want to know is, what is the truth about Stonehenge? Hello, I'm Robert John Langdon and this is a video on Stonehenge where I will debunk most of the myths that have developed over the years to tell you the truth about Stonehenge, how it was made, who made it and why it was made. Now the first fact that any interested person should look into is Stonehenge's position in the landscape. There's a very good reason why someone should look at this because some of the theories, and they are astronomical, come up with the idea that Stonehenge was built for the alignments of stars, moons and planets as the paramount reason for its construction. Now, if that is the case, then one would imagine you placed this monument in the highest position possible in its landscape due to the fact that you'll be able to see the stars, the moon, sunrise and sunset at its best aspect away from the trees and a high horizon obscuring your sunrise or your sunset or the movement of the stars. The reality is that Stonehenge is actually built halfway down a hill. One would have to ask the question, why would you build an astronomical observatory halfway down a hill? You can move Stonehenge in either a southwestern direction or an eastern direction by about 500 meters and actually find yourself on top of the landscape in the area. So why build it halfway down the hill? Now, if we travel to the bottom of the hill, the hill that Stonehenge lies upon, you actually get an answer to the question why Stonehenge was built halfway up this hill. Because at the bottom of this hill is what's known as a dry river valley. Except when Stonehenge was built, it wasn't dry. It's dry today. Uh, it's dry most areas because the groundwaters have been uh, receding for the last 10,000 years since the ice age melted, flooded the landscape and since then our land has been drying up. The groundwater runs into the sea at a very slow rate and that process has been speeded up in the last couple of hundred years by industrialization and housing because the water you drink out of your tap doesn't come from the river it comes from groundwater and that's a hell of a lot of water that we've been drinking and using of the last two or three hundred years and that's why groundwater levels are dropping but in the past groundwater levels were high and when they were high the dry river valleys as we call them today they were no longer dry they were wet they were river valleys so if you place the river valley back into the landscape where Stonehenge exists you suddenly find that Stonehenge is no longer 
halfway up a hill, it is on the shoreline of the prehistoric river valley. So how can we prove that this was a wet river valley at the time of Stonehenge? Well the answer as always is quite simple. You go and look on a geology map and if you look at a geology map you find a very interesting substance at the bottom of these dry river valleys. It's called sand. Well in fact it's sand and clay and gravel generally known as silt and it surrounds Stonehenge because once upon a time Stonehenge was on a peninsula surrounded by water. This revelation shouldn't be a surprise to any intelligent person as it actually then answers one of the biggest questions about Stonehenge and one of the greatest myths about Stonehenge as we saw on the ridiculous documentary at the start of this video. Do we really believe that hundreds of men held on to the ends of ropes dragging stones across Salisbury Plain because they've got nothing better to do? I don't think so. In history we know that monuments have been built of great size by using boats. Boats bring stones to places where the temples have been constructed. The Egyptians did it, the Greeks did it, the Babylonians did it, and for some strange reason our archaeologists think that the Britons didn't do it because we are clearly are stupid and instead of bringing the stones by boat we dragged them across Salisbury Plain and we have found archaeological evidence to show us where the mooring places were around Stonehenge with the real dates for Stonehenge's original construction now we can move on to another myth that um, most archaeologists and documentary programs avoid like the plague and that is the ditch that surrounds Stonehenge. Now you hear a lot of nonsense about ceremonial ditches. No one digs a ditch for a ceremony which is over a meter deep in chalk. Very hard rocky substance particularly when you don't have metal tools. If you're using basic equipment, the last thing you want to do is dig a meter or a two meter ditch because it takes you forever and a day. So when people turn around and suggest that these ditches are ceremonial, my reply to that is, that's fine. Why is it not six inches deep? Why is the ceremonial ditch have to be so deep? But it doesn't end there with that question because the ditches at Stonehenge isn't one large ditch as you would find say in Avery. It's actually a series of small pits joined together and these pits have walls between them. They connect but not fully. Halfway up, they've got little walls. They either made this ceremonial ditch very poorly, or it was designed for something completely different. Our earlier revelation that Stonehenge was once surrounded by water actually helps us in this occasion because chalk is porous. It allows water to flow through it. And if the dry river valley was wet and that the shorelines of that dry river valley were surrounding Stonehenge, when you dig a ditch or pit, it would automatically fill up with water. You do not have a ditch anymore. You have what's known as a moat. Now moats are very interesting because you can do lots of things with moats. 
is it a defensive moat which if you was looking towards the Romans and the Normans you would automatically associate them with well quite possibly defensive the problem is with the chalk they took out of the pit they didn't uh, create a wall as a defensive wall they spread it quite evenly so there wasn't too much of a ridge around the moat therefore you cannot conclude that this is a defensive feature and the archaeological features that are found within the site prove that this was in fact a spa the details of which are contained within my books and lastly on this video i like to debunk the most important aspect of Stonehenge which is its date of construction. Dating of Stonehenge is quite interesting because you can't date stone and you can't date ditches. The only thing you can date is artifacts found on the site and that's exactly where we get our dates from Stonehenge. Their perception of the ditch was that it was dry. We clearly have shown that this ditch was not dry but very wet. Now the artifacts found in the ditch could only be placed there after the moat had dried up, not when the moat was dug. And this is where we get the last myth and the biggest problem. The archaeologists have carbon dated the tools they believe dug the ditch which is known as an antler pick and these antler picks have come up with dates of about two and a half thousand BC that was when the ditches dried up that is when the river started to disappear and it took many thousands of years for the river to drop in height when it the river dropped the ditches would have dried up they would have silted over and inside the silting would have been these picks now the question you must ask yourself if that's the case then Stonehenge must be much much older than 2500 to 3000 BC which is the current guesstimation and remember it is a guesstimation because no one has actually come up with any hard evidence to date on the dating of Stonehenge but there lies yet another problem with the archaeology and again these facts don't turn up on in books and they don't turn up on documentaries for an antler pick to cut into chalk it would have to leave marks not only on the chalk but actually on the antler pick antler picks are quite soft they're not metal and if you cut into the surface a hard surface like chalk which is almost like rock with an antler pick it will blunt it now originally archaeologists believe that these antler picks because they found them in the ditch created the ditch at Stonehenge then they realize that actually you can't use an antler pick to, as an, a pick because the ends of the antler pick will blunt very quickly and one of the interesting aspects of the real evidence of Stonehenge is that not one antler pick has ever been discovered this has been re-sharpened if you're using an antler pick to cut into chalk and archaeologists have now come up with a different method of banging the antler pick in not by hand but with a stone which would also blunt the antler pick unfortunately not one of these antler picks has ever been seen to be resharpened if you've got a flint tool and your antler pick has been blunted because of its digging you would shave the like you do with a pencil you would shave the edge off to get a nice point there has never ever been an antler pick found in Stonehenge with a sharpened edge there's never been an antler pick found in Avery in an even larger ditch with blunt ends and that have been resharpened or blunt ends full stop. This is because the antler picks did not build Stonehenge or Avery for 
one very good reason. There's a much better tool available to the people of that time, and it's called a stone axe. Stone axes don't break. They're easier to use, and they're more efficient. Only an idiot would use an antler pick to try and dig into chalk. It's probably the same idiots that were dragging the large stones around the Salisbury Plain we saw a bit earlier. So why are the antler picks there and what were they used for? Well, if anybody out there has got a pond, you will soon find that any stagnant water, you'll get weed, pond weed and grasses and all associated bits and pieces within the water. If you're actually proactively using the water, and I believe they were at the time, you would have to keep the, the weeds out of the water. And I used to use a rake. Rake was very efficient as getting pond weed out. And, and if I didn't have a rake, I would say the best natural rake that I can think of is an antler pick very effective way of removing pond weed and as shown on the video if you use the antler with a piece of string to obtain the weed eventually one would imagine the string would break and the antler pick would fall to the bottom of the water where sediment would cover it confusing future archaeologists well that's all we've got time for on this video on Stonehenge Debunked. We'll be busting more myths in the future with Stonehenge Debunked Part 2 and 3 and also some other monuments such as Avebury and Earthworks in the very near future. Thank you for listening and I'll speak to you soon.